بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد حبت في الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I hope that you can hear the volume if someone can let me know if the volume is is okay بإذن الله تعالى Alhamdulillah, good. So, from the usul of Iman, Iman of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, which is the usul of Islam, and from the arkan al Islam, or arkan al Iman, the pillars of faith, is the belief in the divine destiny, the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creed, the divine, uh, which is a part of our creed, the divine destiny. And in the Hadith of Jibreel, from amongst some of the other adilla from the Book of Allah, and also the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the Hadith of Jibreel, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked about Iman. And he replied, he said, And tu'mina billahi wa malaikati wa kutubihi wa rasulihi wa tu'mina bi qadri khayrihi wa shar. تؤمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسوله واليوم الآخر وتؤمن بقدر خيره وشر. So the Prophet Ali sallallahu alaihi wasallam he responded to the angel Jibril, who came in the form of a man. He said that uh, iman or faith, when he was asked about it, it is to believe in Allah and تؤمن بالله and the angels and his books and the uh, messengers. عليهم أفضل الصلاة والسلام. And the day of judgment. And to believe in the divine destiny, al Qadr, the good and the bad of it. So that makes up the usul of Iman. And that is, you know, so that's from the foundation of Iman. And it is from the Arkan al Iman, the pillars of Iman, meaning our Iman rest upon that. And that has to do with Amur al You know, it begins, of course, the first uh, pillar is believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's Tawheed. That's the, the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, who you've never seen. You've never seen your Lord, Tabarak wa ta'ala. And you will not see your Lord, Tabarak wa ta'ala, in this dunya. And, but yet you pray five times a day to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you strive to have taqwa. You know, to fear his commands, you believe in the Qur'an, which is his books. That is also from the pillar of Iman. But the topic today we want to discuss is about a little bit about the divine destiny. And what better way to do that than to go to a book like Sahih Muslim, and this is the summarized version, and to read some of the ahadith, ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, about the divine destiny of what Imam Muslim uh, collected. And with that being so important for every Muslim to believe, it's important that you have, that you read and you study about this pillar of Iman, this pillar of faith. And as far as its practice, why is that important? Well, that there's a, a direct relationship to the concept of sabr, of patience. And that the believer is ordered to be, have sabr. This is the, one of the sifat of the mu'mineen, the, belie- the traits of the, the believers. Is that their patience, and in Allah ma'asabrin, and, and verily Allah is with those who are patient. And patience, a part of sabr, is accepting the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you are patient. So, for example, if a musiba, something happens to you, some trial or tribulation, you experience death in your family, uh, your friends, loved ones, uh, you know, some struggle that you, you, you have, some difficulty that it is upon you to be patient, to have sabr. 
And what does that mean? That means accepting the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That this is part of the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being patient with that qadr. And being pa meaning patient on your tongue. And on your limbs. And in your heart. The patience on your tongue is of course that you refrain from showing displeasure to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for example, cursing time or cursing and behaving disobedient through the tongue. That's showing patience, that you're accepting that. And the patience on the limbs is that you do not show uh, disobedience and displeasure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, decree by, for example, tearing at your clothes, uh, tearing at your face, pulling your hair, whatever the case may be, or doing something disobedient physically, showing your displeasure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine decree, you know, out of despair and anxiety. And the impatience or the sabr in the heart this has to do with being pleased or being pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree and accepting it. That does not mean you have to love the musibah, the harm that comes to you. So, for example, you lose your grandfather or you lose your spouse through divorce or you lose your grandfather through death. This is a masiba. You don't love that that masiba happened to you, but yet you're patient, you're patient, and you have you don't show disobedience and displeasure towards your Lord, and you accept that in your heart, even though it hurts. It hurts in your heart. It hurts for those who've experienced divorce. That divorce is something that wrecks uh, you know, people psychologically. That's one of the ways it affects people. You know, it's a big trial and test. And, and especially if there's children involved, you know, the, the breaking of families. Also, accepting the death of a loved one. That's very difficult. You don't receive pleasure from that because you're pleased with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mean you're happy with the masiba, But rather, you are accepting and you are not illustrating that displeasure on your limbs and on your tongue nor in your heart even though it hurts so you try to deal with things through patience and through obedience to Allah so that is a part that's a part of that importance of why we need to study <coughs> study the qadr of Allah the de divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in order to exercise our iman because when the real Masiba comes to you, it's real. Everybody's trial is different. For example, some people, if they lose money or lose their wealth, it's easy for them to accept it. It's not a big deal. Maybe they have wealth and it's not a big, big deal to them or they're just not attached to wealth like that. Whereas another person is affected extremely, uh, you know, it, it affects them uh, quite a bit when they lose their wealth and they feel harm and they feel sorrow because of their attachment to wealth. Likewise, that can deal with anything. One man's trial can be another man's, it could be another person's fortune. But the point is, is we all have different things that affect us differently. Some people it has to do, as we said, when it comes to marriage, having to do with the opposite gender or the opposite sex, whatever you want to say, meaning that, you know, uh, you know, uh, the husband and the wife or, or, or about to, you're about to get married and then it breaks off. So you as a woman, you're sad because you really like the brother, but then he broke it off or his family intervened or vice versa. Okay. You get attached. So for some people, that's a big masiba. It's hard for them to deal with that. So, so everyone's masiba trial is different and everyone re deals with trials in different ways. So with that being the case, this 
acceptance of the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine destiny of Allah is a is so important. That's why it's a pillar of Iman, because it is a test. Your test is different than my test. Maybe I can break down in the desert, which I did about last weekend I did. <laughs> and, you know, it, it didn't, it was disheartening, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me see the barakah in it. And within two hours, we were towed, and the part was there, and we were back on the road. That was a, just like a, a mind-blowing na'mah from Allah. That within, it only delayed us two hours, and we literally broke down in, for those who are aware of degrees, in 93, 94, maybe 92 degrees weather, which maybe is 36, I don't know, it's very hot. And it was dry. But we had water, we had things to get us through. But within two hours, I had gotten a tow truck and the tow truck, they happened to have my old part to get me back on the road and I still made my road trip. And we were able to come and, 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 and do the things we wanted to do and have a very good and productive weekend. So it's how you deal with those trials. Maybe someone else might have pulled their hair out. Why is this always happening to me? Woe is me, cursing getting upset. You've seen people who don't know how to deal with the Qadr and that's a weakness in Iman. That is one of the reasons why it's so important for us to study the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remind ourselves and not to hold deep into the Qadr. Meaning don't delve deep into the Qadr. Some of the people they want to ask a lot of in detailed, que uh, detailed questions about it. But the Sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala in they had the best madrasa and the best mudaris. They, they learned from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who taught them not to delve deep into the, 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 the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But rather, and tu'mina, and tu'mina bi, you know, believe in the divine destiny. And what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said? Khayrihi wa shar, and tu'mina bi khayrihi wa shar. Believe in the good and the bad of it, meaning it's there are things that happen to you. It's not a good thing if your child, you lose your child. May Allah protect all of our children. But think about all of your brothers and sisters in Yemen, for example, that are really living that. Or in Syria or in Philistine. The Yehud are just killing, shooting women journalists and stuff like this. Think about the children that get killed like that. Sometimes, you know, it's a young child, a young boy, a young girl shot by a, a shaitan. A shaitan shoots them. And the parents have to deal with that masiba and the sorrow or that they're bombed by the Zionists, the Yahud, the, the shaitan from amongst jinn and men. They bombed the Muslimin. Well, oppress them and it affects their children. So to lose that, to lose that, it takes, uh, it requires patience. And it requires a part of that patience is accepting the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Accepting the divine decree of Allah Azza wa Jal. Qala Imam Muslim al-Musannif rahimahullah ta'ala. Qala al-Musannif rahimahullah ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kitab al-Qadr. So Imam Muslim, and again this is a summarized, and this is... Uh, the summarized ver uh, version of uh, Sahih Muslim from Imam Mundari, Rah Rahimahumullah Jami'an. And it shows us the beauty of Ahl al-Ilm, SubhanAllah, what they left behind for us. This is another reason why I want to remind myself and you to follow the path of Ahl al-Ilm. Follow the path of scholarship. Because there isn't truly a, 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 a ladha, something more delicious in this dunya and satisfying than engaging in your life with, with knowledge. And the reward is immense for those who attain it and share it and are sincere. The reward is immense. But those are few, I think. They're few. And as I, I was mentioning this yesterday to my brothers during the khutbah, the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, about the three, in al-awwal al-nas yuqda alayhi yawm al-qiyamah, verily the first people, three people to be uh, judged on the day of judgment, the first one is the mujahid. So here he's doing the greatest deed he could be doing, 
But yet, because his intention was not correct, it turned out it, it got him dragged into the hellfire. And the second one was the one who was a Qadi or an Alam. He was a, 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 a beautiful reciter. I, I learned knowledge and I taught it, you know, and I re recited the Quran for you. This is what he see, will say Yom to the to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of Allah Azza wa Jal. And then it will be said, Kadabd, you lied, but rather you did it so that the people would call you a Qadi, a, a beautiful reciter, or you did it so that the people would say you were an Alam, that you were a person of knowledge. So that's why this is one of the highest duties you can do. But yet there's a massive amounts of responsibility with it and that if you don't do it correctly, mean with the correct intention and constantly fight and, and try to purify your intention, it can be a source of your destruction. Doing the highest deeds you can do in Islam can actually get you into the hellfire if it's not done correctly. What does that also show us? It shows us the two conditions for having your deeds accepted in Islam. Wa what are they? They are that you have sincerity to Allah, ikhlas, and that you do it in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So those are important reminders, even though we got off topic, but that shows us, you know, it's just the beauty of ilm. It's the beauty of knowledge. It's the beauty of knowledge. So do seek knowledge. Seek knowledge to the extent of your ability. Immerse yourself in the books and try to find the, that, uh, that ladha that many of the great scholars, especially from the Salaf, described for us. Rahimahumullah jami'an. So Imam Muslim, or in Imam Mundari's uh, Mukhtasar, he says the book of Qadr, the book of the divine decree. And he mentions first, the first bab, he says, Bab fi qawlihi ta'ala inna kulla shay'in khalaqanahu bi qadr. He mentions, he, he entitled the chapter, he said the chapter of Allah's statement, the Almighty, his statement, where Allah says in the Quran, we have created everything according to measure, to due proportion. Everything is according to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and, in accordance with uh, the measure, with due measure. It's not out of uh, balance. Even all the things we do to try to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, try to defy the laws that he has um, uh, established, it's all in accordance to due measure. And, and it's appointed. And it's by the decree of Allah. And it's by the knowledge of Allah. And it was written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is according to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are the maratib. Maratib al-qadr. Those are the levels of the divine decree of the qadr. So here uh, he, he mentions this. Uh, this. Uh, uh, this ayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then. He mentions a hadith of Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala. He said, Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala, who reported, the polytheist of Quraysh came to have an argument with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in regards to destiny. And then these verses were revealed. On the day when they are dragged into the fire in their faces, taste the touch of fire. Surely we created everything according to uh, a measure. So it shows us that the people of disbelief have always, uh, from the time of the Prophet والسلام, up until now, you'll find many of them, they dispute the Qadr, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially those pure polytheists, meaning the pure pagans. You know, Ahl Kitab, they believe in uh, aspects of the, the Qadr. A lot of Christians, you know, they will authenticate that. They'll believe, they believe in a degree. They have some similar beliefs if they are people that are faithful even in their own tradition. They have a, a belief in that. But there are many polytheists and others who outright reject the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they challenge the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is a sifa, min sifat al mushrikeen it's a trait from amongst the traits of the, the polytheists. That's why the Muslim, that's a pillar of their uh, iman, 
is believing in the decree of Allah, not debating and arguing with the decree of Allah, learning to accept the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about all the hardships and difficulties that you had in your life that you grew from. But during that time, you disliked it. You hated the masiba that you were going through. It was so hard. You were so sad. You were so humiliated. But those masaib, those issues, those things, they helped to build you who you are today, bi'idnillah ta'ala. They helped to build you who you are. Wa kullu hadha min qadr Allah. Kullu hadha, all of that is from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all from the divine decree of Allah. And that's why we have to learn and take heed to those things. You know, we don't like the death in our families. We don't like those things, but hopefully we gain some learning, some benefit, or it strengthens our armor of Iman. It helps us to build our Iman because we dealt with that masiba. So when the next trial comes, we're able to deal with it easier. Because many people, they turned their backs on Islam. They turned their backs on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when, when the masaib, when the masiba strikes them. You know, some people, they have a masiba, they have a, a trial or a test in their faith, period. And then they, they, they leave their deen, they, they, the, that test in their, their iman, subhanAllah. And I think one of the benefits of traveling and meeting the believers around the world, you see people who are, you meet people sometimes who are just, Allah's favored them on a high level of iman. They have very little in the dunya, but yet they, their iman, their faith is so strong. And they, and they, and that's a lesson for you. I've seen people who are so poor and they have nothing, but all you can get from them is alhamdulillah and smiles and generosity and kindness. And they don't stress on the dunya. And then there are some people who have so much in the dunya, but they only receive stress and difficulty and headache and trials. And sometimes that those things even destroy them and they leave their iman. And I'm just reflecting on a couple of people that I've either met. Whoa, a little mini field mouse or some creature I just saw uh, that they um, the people they are tested and they fail. They are, they're tested and they fail. And then they leave Iman totally. The next hadith, uh, he mentions, he says, Bab kullu shay bi qadr hattal ajiz wa kais. He says the chapter, everything is done, you know, in accordance with, you know, by the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by measure even weakness and strength. Look at the fiqh of uh, the a'emma, the fiqh, the understanding of the, the, the imams. They didn't have to write extensively in their collections, but rather they could just give you a chapter heading and then they gave you a hadith with immense benefits. This creature's biting me. Immense benefits. And those uh, benefits can be derived just from a, a title. And then they bring you the nas. Then they bring you the text. So he mentions uh, Tawus, Rahimullah Ta'ala reported, I met some companions. So he's a tabi'i. He said, I met some companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who were saying everything is done by Allah according to uh, Al-Qadr, the preordainment. He said, and I heard Abdullah bin Umar say everything is done by Allah according to a foreordained even weakness and strength or he said strength and weakness that shows you that everything and every aspect of of us and those you encounter and everything 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 is by the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so sometimes when we think about things our shortcomings and so forth. Yes, we're, we're to blame for our shortcomings. So we're not like the Mu'tazila and, and other groups that rejected the, the, the Qadr or said that we're forced to do what we do, like the Jabriya, uh, Jabriya and others. But however, 
Everything is, is known and written and ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing escapes his will and his knowledge. Even our weaknesses and our shortcomings, the fact that you return to sin after Ramadan, the, ta the fact that you are uh, on istiqamah after Ramadan, the fact that you are, you know, whatever the case may be, the fact that we're sitting here, have a Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you would come on this channel and that I would deliver something on this channel. This is by the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we even know of one another. It's only by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree. Tabarak ta'ala. And so accepting that and understanding that that is from the itiqad of Ahl sunnah It's from the belief of Ahl sunnah Wa kayfa dhalik? How do we know this? How do we know this that this is from the itiqad of Ahl sunnah Wa la habati fillah andhir la hadha nas. Look at what we just read. And it was from who? It was from a tabi'i. And it was from who? Who was narrating on the Sahaba. Radiallahu ta'anu majma'een. And those Sahabi, those Sahaba that, uh, like uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu ta'anu majma'een, and they were just very clearly explaining about the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kulu shay bi qadrullah. Except everything is from the decree of Allah. That seems simple. But how many Muslims understand that and practice that? How many Muslims say, and they know those pillars, but whenever a trial and whenever thing, anything happens, they totally forget that it's by the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's probably a natural human inclination. But the person of stronger iman, depending on the level of your iman and cognizant of your Lord and your taqwa is going to help you realize and kick in and say, subhanAllah, Whatever my Lord is willed, I'm ready to accept it and I'm going to get through this Rabbi, by the permission of my Lord. That's accepting that decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is accepting the divine decree of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. The next hadith, he says, Bab fil amr bil quwa wa tark al ajiz. Okay, so here there's also a, 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 an intent here of why he's talking about the strength and the weakness and bringing those narrations because this is actually a refutation as well. He's refuting some of the people of bid'ah and desires. Some of the people who say we're forced to do everything we, we, we uh, do and that we have no choice and I'm a wicked sinner so I can just keep in sin and... You know, even some of them will attribute injustice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They'll say that our Lord is unjust. Or they'll say it is not from justice that our Lord will punish us. So, you know, I can do what I want. There's all kind of itiqad that people come to believe because of a misunderstanding of the qadr. And this is why you find the, the salaf writing books like this and collecting the narrations and putting it with these titles there's a maqsad, there's a fiqh, there's an understanding and there's an intent to refute the people and of, bat, of, of batal, the people of falsehood and desires and their false ideologies and their false concepts around the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, the chapter, the order to practice strength and not weakness, in that you don't accept, you don't say, well, it's the qadr of Allah, so I'm going to keep doing the sin. It's the decree of Allah. If Allah wants, I would be praying salat. If Allah wants, I'd be doing good deeds. No, you have to keep fighting. Like in the hadith, when the Prophet ﷺ uh, was uh, riding on a donkey with Mu'adh, and Mu'adh, he said, Kuntu radif al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala himar. He says, I was with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala himar. Ala himar. I was behind the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala himar. And faqal, uh, and the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Mu'adh, tadri ma haqa Allah al-ibad, wa haqa al-ibad ya Allah. Oh Mu'adh, do you know the right of Allah upon his servant and the right of the servant upon Allah? Uh, and he said, Qultu Allah wa Rasulu alam. Allah and his messenger know best. So then the Prophet ﷺ talked about Tawheed. He said, haqa Allah al-ibadi, in ya'buduhu, wa la yushriku bi shayin. The right of Allah upon his servant is that he, uh, that meaning the servant, that they worship Allah alone and they don't associate partner, partners with him. And the right of the servant over Allah is that Allah will not punish him if he uh, does not commit shirk. But here's the here's the uh, the shahid I wanted to mention. So then after that, uh, the prophet. Uh, so then, 
uh, Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala, and he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, ya, ya Rasulullah, afala ubashir al-nas, O Messenger of Allah, should I tell the people? And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said, La tabashirhum faliyattaqilu. Don't tell them because they will rely on that. They'll depend on it. Meaning they will stop doing deeds. They will become dependent and say, well, as long as I don't commit shirk, I, I don't have to do any more good deeds. So that would discourage them because of the nature of people. So the point being here, Ahabit is that the believer should always strive that yes, the divine decree, it is destined, but you should always strive to achieve, achieve goodness and to do good and to be a part of good and stay away from evil. You, you don't say, well, I'm, I'm gonna accept this situation. La. You have to always strive to better yourself and do good deeds and, be, uh, and exercise your iman. You can't say, well, it's the divine destiny of Allah. I've had this masiba or these difficulties are happening in my life. I'm just gonna immerse myself in depression and accepting the difficulties. La, you have to do whatever it takes to better and improve yourself and improve your situation. So don't don't accept uh, don't accept it. So he mentions he says Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, A strong believer is better and more lovable to Allah than a weak believer, and there is good in both. Cherish that which gives you uh, cherish that which gives you benefit in the hereafter, and seek help from Allah and do not lose heart. And if anything in the form of trouble comes to you, don't say, if I had not done that, it would not have happened such and such. But say, Allah has forndained. And he does whatever he wills. For if opens the gate to the shaitan. So here, Ahabatifila, again, this is an exercise in Iman because this hadith encourages us to accept the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not dwell on blame and not dwell and say, oh, if only I had did th done this, if only so-and-so would have done this, uh, uh, and, 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 and opening the door to the shaitan, because this can open the door for you to reject the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I'm going to give you an example that really happened to me in Medina. May Allah forgive us in the individual but I was teaching at a college, it was known as the College of Qulit Mu'alameen. And I was with one of my beloved colleagues who still lives in Medina, may Allah preserve him from the UK. It's my man Jamal Adin, half of Allah Ta'ala. And we were driving, we finished work, and it was blazing hot as usual in Medina. Uh, and we were gonna, I had Darus, I was gonna go, and I think it was Ramadan even. And we were in the parking lot of the college. We were just leaving work and we're fasting and it's blazing hot in my old bucket that I used to have, meaning the old car that barely drove. And we got in there and all of a sudden in the parking lot, there's all this room in the parking lot and a student, a Saudi student, not one of ours, but he's, you know, a, a college student and him and his friend, they just are going too fast in the parking lot. They have the whole parking lot and they hit us head on, boom. And I'm gonna remind him of this next time I talk to him. But anyhow, so I remember this student saying to me, and the way he was using it is what the Salaf used to refer uh, to oh, something similar to this. I forgot the term exactly, but it means when you, uh, uh, when you rely and abuse the concept of the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're just reckless and careless. And then you just say, oh, it's the decree of Allah. And that's how I felt how this guy, you know, there could have been, you know, we have to use common sense. So we don't just, you know, Qadr Allah, I just wrecked your car. I just wrecked into you. Uh, but I remember what a test that was. You know, that was a big test. And I had some durus I was attending. And I had to walk after towing and all this crazy stuff. And I went to the haram uh, or by the haram. And I, I remember that that was in Ramadan. And it was a big test. 
You know, he wrecked my car. We're in the middle of the day in this blazing hot. And then he's just saying, oh, Qadr Allah, and just taking it lightly, you know. So this is uh, not Ittimad al-Qadr, but you see some people, they abuse the concept in the way they use it. So they're just careless. So, for example, the one, he's not trying to do anything, change anything in his life, and he falls into regular sins. He, he commits akramakum Allah, zina, or he steals. And so, you know, he just says, Qadr Allah ma sha fa'al, he's counting up the money. You know, Qadr Allah, this is ihtijaj bil qadr. It's called ihtijaj bil qadr. To like depend and rely or, but it's in this, in the context of abusing the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you just say, for example, there's a narration, uh, and I believe it's related, uh, you know, it has to do, I'm going to paraphrase it, with Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and, and someone was brought to him who had been stealing, and he said, Oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, uh, Qadr Allah ma shafa'al. You know, this is the divine will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I was stealing. And Umar said, yes, you're right. And it's the divine will of Allah that I cut your hand. So this subhanAllah was Umar radiallahu ta'ala and his rad, his reputation on those who make ihtijaj bil qadr. Those people who, who abuse the concept of the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam, those things were written by Allah. But that doesn't mean that you're careless and you uh, and you abuse the concept and say and allow and make it as an excuse for doing sinfulness and wickedness. Okay, those are just some of the things uh, that <clears throat> we'll mention around that. We'll just mention those few ahadith, and we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the Almighty, to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wasallam ala nabi and Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbi wa sallam. And if there are any questions, we'll try to entertain it, and hopefully. Our phone is not getting too hot. It is getting a little warm out in the sun. So we'll just see what we can do. Bi'idhnillah ta'ala. I mean, may Allah guide us all and protect us all. I mean, <clears throat> visit the the UK. Inshallah, I've wanted to for many years. Hopefully, one day I will be able to be in a position financially to go. That will be great. I have many, many friends. Some of my best friends in the dunya live in the UK, and I hope and I can't wait to. Bidn Allah, that is on my. Um, list of things I want to do be idnillah ta'ala is visit some of my mahboob and visit some of the communities there uh, in the UK be idnillah ta'ala Al-Qadr reminds me of the saying, there is no power and no strength except by Allah, and surely Allah is the greatest. Naam. What are your thoughts on going to International Open University for Seeking Knowledge, Islamic Studies Program for Beginners? Uh, the International Open University. I don't know. Um, I, I, think you're talk, I think that's Bilal Phillips' place, I think. If, the, if I'm correct, International Open University. I think, the, yeah, I O U. I mentioned that before that he has some very beneficial programs on there, it seems. So I think that's a great place to start. And that I have a, a, a good friend of mine who's a Talib al Ilm who knows Arabic and has been in Yemen and studied. And he did some higher level courses there and he said it was very ben beneficial he learned a lot some courses about dawa and stuff like this so taken from his word that there's a lot of benefit that you can gain so uh, my encouragement is in general just to seek to seek islamic knowledge and go to the places and benefit from those trustworthy people and trustworthy programs so 
Nam. So it has uh, a lot of benefits in its curriculum. Bi'idnillah ta'ala. And hopefully, Athari will be a place where people will be able to go and, and gain a, a, a foundation as well. Bi'idnillah. And, uh, and some of the other places that are already going, like where our brother uh, Ustad, uh, uh, Ustad Abdurrahman Hassan, his institute, as well as the brother Dawaman uh, in the UK. I think, gu not Guidance College, but I can't think of the name of it. And, you know, some of, there's many institutes out there that are beginning to prop up that teach the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah. And so that's the most important thing is that you are gaining the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah, especially if you don't have the ability to travel and go abroad to benefit. Uh, what advice would you give your brothers and sisters that are struggling with the fitna of the West? Well, there are many fitnas of the West and the East. So that's my first thing is to say, don't think that it's only in the West, whatever your fitna is. So if your fitna has to do with Akramakum Allah because of the um, fitna of the opposite sex and there's not the Islamic rules and regulations, then, of course... Of course, then you you have to uh, do whatever it takes to uh, get away from that fitna and protect yourself and preserve your religion. And I've talked about that extensively, about how to hopefully safeguard your iman and your faith from the fitna that uh, is out there. You know, and there's plenty of it, and there always will be. So you will have to. Uh, if you're a, a person who's able to make hijrah, to be able to leave and go to live in the Muslim lands or, or at least uh, do talab al-ilm there or something, then this is khair. Do business, whatever the case may be, whatever it takes to save your iman. Or be in a place at least where there's a lot more believers and you can kind of protect yourself and surround yourself with good. Then this is also khair. This is also something that will help you in your iman. So... That's what I would say in general, and I've done many videos uh, about this topic. Uh, so, yeah, as you said. And one of the things that's very important is that if you have, you are struggling with the fitna of the, if you're struggling with the fitna of the opposite sex, Ikramakum Allah, then you should also strive your best to try to get married. So if you are a, a man who is struggling with that, uh, then and tested with that, then he should strive his best to try to put himself in a, in a situation where he can get married financially and every other means that's lawful to try to protect himself. And likewise, the women, that if that is a trial for them and they're ready to be married, then they do have to make effort um and naam so those those are things and some of the sisters they do they put forth you know if they can't find what they're looking for in their locality then they strive in other means sometimes speaking to people who they trust to try to find them a spouse this is okay this is permissible so it is uh very important that we make effort to remedy our affairs and especially if we are miftun, if we are having uh, problems and we are struggling with, uh, the, with those trials of the opposite sex. As the Prophet Ali, he, salatu wa salam, said, Ya ma'ashir al-shabab, min istata'a minkum az-zawj, min istata'a, Minkum al Oh youth, those who those amongst you who have the ability to do so, then get married. Okay, so the Prophet والسلام, ordered that we should do that, and he mentions some of the reasons behind that is because it will help you lower your gaze. That if you have a good, pleasing spouse, that that will help you to deal with the fitna of the opposite sex, which is a part of your nature. It's a part of your fitra. You know, women want to be married and they want to have the lawful, uh, good 
of marriage as well as men. They want, that's their inclination. So it is important to strive to protect yourself and preserve yourself by using the prophetic means. Isn't it correct to say taqwa increases piety, but piety does not increase taqwa? That, those are, I'm not going to say philosophical concept, even though they do kind of have a philosophical tone to it. Um, but as is commonly tr uh, translated, often people, it's translated taqwa as piety, okay? Or sometimes it's bitter. For example, uh, or fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's a very close relationship between uh, this concept and sometimes we even use the use that that word to describe taqwa you know meaning that if we want to talk about a more a more specific uh, definition perhaps <clears throat> or a little more detailed would be uh, saying that it is to adhere to the commandments of Allah and avoid his prohibitions okay that that is one of the definitions that some of the classical scholars referred to when they referred to the concept of taqwa. So as far as that phrase that you used, Allah knows best. Allah knows best because it can be one in the same. Uh, you know, I, I don't know who said that and what their muk said, what they were trying to say by that. But I would just concentrate on the importance of knowing and understanding the concept of taqwa, that taqwa should be that which is the increasing of your, uh, of your uh, obedience to Allah and following his commandments and avoiding his prohibition. So those things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded in the Quran that you're striving to do those things. And those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited in the Quran that you're trying to avoid those things. That that is the illustration of taqwa. And no doubt taqwa has a very strong uh, link with iman, with, uh, your, with your iman. And some of the concepts in Islam that sometimes their definitions that they overlap. And as a, one of the qawaid or principles that the scholars mention is that when the when for example if islam and iman are mentioned fi idha ijtama'a uh tafarraq with a tafarraqa ijtama'a so if those concepts are mentioned together islam and iman then their meaning is 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 different they have different meanings you know as we know the pillars of islam and the pillars of iman or the the concept of faith in Islam. But if they are mentioned separately, they're inclusive. Islam is inclusive of Iman. And when you hear that Iman is mentioned, it's also, of course, inclusive of Islam. So their meanings are the same when they are separate. And when they're together in a text, then their meanings are different. You know, it's there to distinguish those meanings. Like bir and taqwa. Wa biri wa taqwa. So since bir and taqwa is mentioned in that ayah together, that means there it has they have some some differences between the concept of bir, wa taqwa. You know, the concept of piety and maybe God fearfulness, or however you want to uh, translate that. They have some some slight differences in meaning, and that's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned them together. But when they're mentioned separately, they one may be more in, uh, inclusive of the other. They, it's encompassing, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. And you'll find that with many uh, uh, concepts. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hear these enemies of Islam saying taqiya. I've never heard this term ever in studies or ta'lim class. Uh, yeah, the, the Shia practices. Taqi, uh, okay, I don't know if you mean taqwa or you mean taqiyya. Taqiyya is a concept the Shia use 
to hide what they really believe, to hide their, it's like hiding their iman. So then they can pray and pretend to be around Ahl Sunnah and to accept things of Ahl Sunnah, that that's per permissible in their, their belief, uh, which is a type of kedhib and a type of hypocrisy. It's a type of lying and hypocrisy, but that's what they, uh, they practice that concept of taqiyya. And if you mean taqwa, of course, as we mentioned, is a whole different concept. Are marriage meetings Islamically appropriate? For example, meeting along with a mahram to see if the two are compatible. Jazakallah khairam. Uh, if there's a mahram, then there's no problem in that, inshallah ta'ala. You know, if there's the intent, because it is important that there is some that you know about that, that spouse, especially in this day and age of kathrat al-talaq, where there is so much divorce and so forth. And also because, especially, especially for us in the West, but even around the world, now because of the the increase of fitna and the increase of seeing and following our desires, that it's important that you're pleased with uh, the spouse to, that you're going to marry, that you have some attraction. You know, yes, there are some women that will actually marry, they just want a, a believing man, they don't care what he looks like, whatever his disposition. There are some, and perhaps there are some men, but men are less likely to be like that. Most men, you know, looks are very important that they, uh, you know, emphasize that to a greater or lesser extent. So it is important if it is Islamically, <clears throat> you know, the, the people, it's an Islamic, as you said, an Islamic chaperone, it's the mahram or what have you, then uh, nam, if that is uh, the way for them to meet and to get to, to, to know one another in that Comp company, not obviously excessive, you know, every day they're always meeting at the cafe and then it becomes casual and then the mahram is not there. And no, we're not talking about that. But with this maqsad of getting to know and to marry, it's, it's important. It's important to know and to, for brothers to not be um, thinking that they are only you know, a lot of some brothers, they are under the delusion that they say, you know, I just want a religious sister. Yes, that's true. But they also had better take a look and so forth. Because I know many brothers who have married and they married overseas in Yemen and Somalia and other places and Saudi Arabia. And then they weren't really attracted to that person. And the glow wears off quickly. So it's very important that you find someone who is also pleasing to your eye. That you can, so those, those are important uh, things to consider uh, in having those sit downs, bi idnillah ta'ala. Taqwa is a feeling in the heart. It's a direct connection between Allah and the slave. This is what our, our friend Lib Liban said, I think. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Does the Athidi Institute have a PayPal account in which we can donate in order to support the propagation of true Salafi da'wah? Allah yabarak fiki. I don't right now because I... I um, uh, because right now I'm just trying to focus on where I need if if I need money to go forward with the next step. So I've pretty much recorded right now. I need to take time and I need perhaps a little help in finishing some editing to where I should be able to launch the first level. I'm pretty much at that stage. So if I determine that I need a, a little startup money to help launch the to help launch then inshallah i will uh do an advertisement to do so uh, at this stage i do not and i prefer not to ask for money and collect money 
ta'ala. But if if there is a need and I get closer to that stage, ta'ala, then perhaps maybe I will if I need to do so, inshallah ta'ala, so we can go ahead and get it launched because it has been a long time coming. So bi'idnillah, we are closer. Jazakallah khairan. May Allah reward you for your intent. <clears throat> are you aware of the term medkhari? <laughs> I read something about it and someone that I know called you a medkhari. From my understanding, it's Salafis calling other Salafis this term. I also hear the name Sayyid when one talking about the term Madhali, do you know much of him? I think you mean Sayyid uh, Qutb. Um, I just literally did a video this morning and you can watch it and it talks about those some of those very issues. Um, Madhali is actually a, a tribe or it means an adherent to the tribe uh, Madhaliya. Um, and so there are several Mashaykh, obviously there's probably many Mashaykh, from that tribe, but there's some well-known ones that are uh, in Medina, such as Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi al-Medkhali, uh, Sheikh Rabi al-Medkhali. So they are by tribe, Medkhali. And whoever is amongst their tribe is Medkhali. So it's a tribal affiliation. But what you have also is you have some people who usually differ with those Mashaykh in their opinion, there's also uh, Sheikh Zaid al Medkhali, Rahmatullahi, who was an alam who passed uh, probably in the past uh, 10 years or so. And usually, what people mean by that is that they use it as a means to attack uh, Sheikh Rabi' or his students or people who may blind follow the sheikh, some people who have fallen into that. And I talked about this in detail earlier this morning. You'll find the video uh, from this morning. And so it's used in a derogatory sense. So, of course, there are people who will call me medkhali, even though I've said that countless times that I don't blind follow the sheikh. They will use this term. It's a way to belittle. And sometimes they do this because of um, they, you know, it's a way of showing animosity that they dislike what we're doing or they use it as a means to try to belittle what we're doing in order bec because we don't share the position that they do on certain individuals or something. So, for example... Some people, they want you to make love and hate based on the sheikh or love and hate based on disliking the sheikh. So what you'll find is you'll find Hizbi groups and sects and individuals and personalities and mubtadiyah. And what they will say is they'll say, oh, you like Sheikh Rabi, you don't hate him, then you're a medkhali because you don't speak about him and we disagree with him here and we hate him for this and we don't like him here and he spoke about our beloved Said Qutb who's a, uh, a, a martyr here. We don't like that. You are a medkhali. So some people, they point the finger based on that. It's, it's based on their desires. It's, it's what we call atifa in Arabic, meaning they have an affection and an affinity and they allow that affection and affinity for Said Qutb, not looking at his egregious mistakes and sinfulness as far as the things that he, well, he did. I mean, he went to America and the things, it's well known, you know, that's well documented. You can see him in his, his um, probably his, uh, his, um, his graduation picks and, and, and the things that he experienced, I think going to church, all kind of stuff, you know, if you want to look it up in detail. Now, I'm not going to claim exactly, but I, from what I, I'm giving you a loose thing, but you'll find many of those things. But as far as his statements, you'll find many, many, many serious mistakes in Akita. So they will defend those things. They won't even look to that. And they'll claim he is a scholar when that was not, I don't think he would claim, would have claimed he was a scholar, but he did write a tafsir of the Quran. Why? Because he was very prolific in the Arabic language. He was very, he was a, a uh, you know, a person of literature. I can't think of what we call that in English. Um, but he was very prolific 
and very good with words and in literature, you know, a high level of Arabic and a high level of, you know, they call it adib, you know, maybe someone who knows poetry very well and, and, and so forth. A linguist, perhaps. And, but that does not give you a right to make tafsir of the Quran, even though even a lot of scholars of Ahl Sunnah praised his tafsir from some angles. But a lot of his commentary, when they go into it, they see that there's even statements that perhaps can be statements of kufr and that are very egregious about, um, about um, uh, prophets, like Prophet Musa, alayhi salatu wasalam. So he uses a sloob that is so far from the Salaf al -Sali and so far from the classical scholars and so much in tune with more in tune with uh, Mu'tazila and people like this, that of course these are uh, bidas and bida after bida after bida and mistake. So with that, these people will love and never speak ill about Sayyid. They love him, but they will attack those who criticize him with knowledge, who criticize him in detail. So this it is what it is. People are always going to have claims. But as we've said many times, al-ibra, bi haqaiq laysa bi musamiyat, the reality of something is in its name, not in its claim. So I can claim that you're this, you can claim that I'm that, but the reality is, is that we are who we are. And hopefully that your adherence is to the book of Allah and the sunnah, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the madhab of the salaf. That is, we're in hopes of that as Muslims. That's what we want to die upon. We don't want to be on anything other than that. As far as Salafis using those terms, I don't know of any Salafis. If someone uses that term, I usually don't even consider them Salafi because I don't know of any scholars that preceded them. Now, I know there are some big Dawah heads, and I'm not going to name their names, but I know that they talk about Sheikh Rabi or Medhalis, and they claim this and they claim that. Those people I don't really respect in Dawah uh, because of that, because it shows me that they have a, uh, an intent and they are going against what our scholars of Ahlul Sunnah, even scholars that disagree with Sheikh Rabi' on many issues, they never, I've never heard, even Sheikh Ali Hassan Al Halabi, who went to his grave and him and Sheikh Rabi' had their differences. Even Sheikh Yahya Al Hujuri in Yemen and Sheikh Rabi', you would never hear Sheikh Yahya, no matter how much they criticize each other and dislike each other and have fallen out, or even Sheikh Mohammed bin Hadi, of course. They would never use this. They don't see that as a hezb in that sense. But only the people of hezbiyah use those terminologies. And that's in accordance with my tatab, in my following up these issues. And what I've seen and what I'm saying is Khalid Green is what I uh, um, see that most of these people are hezbis themselves because they allow that affection and that atafa because they have particular mashayikh that they like that have been criticized by Sheikh Rabi and other Mashaykh of Ahl Sunnah, so they're hurt, their feelings are hurt. So then they want to go back and say, those guys are extreme, those guys are this, and we don't like them, and we're gonna take our toys back. So then they do that, they wanna take their toys back, and then their toys that they're trying to take back is almost their Salafiyah. And that's what I would say, because when you criticize ulama of Ahl Sunnah, and you criticize whole groups of Ahl Sunnah because you think that they are a hizb, then this is problematic. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Advice for someone who is dealing with waswas. How do we know that these thoughts have become doubts or have settled in the heart? Especially if these thoughts or feelings in the heart are rep repetitive. Uh, who's dealing with waswas. So I've talked also about that in general. So when it comes to your ibadah especially that you should strive your utmost to fight that waswas. And the way is the prophetic medicine. As the Prophet wasallam said, for example, if you're in doubt of whether you pass gas or not in Salat, uh, the Prophet wasallam said, uh, The Prophet wasallam he mentioned that, for example, if you're having waswas in the Salat and you don't know if you broke your wudu or not, you know, you don't know, did I, you know, that you go back and you, uh, if you did not smell anything, and if you did not um, hear anything, then you continue with your prayer. Now, if your waswas pertains to your tahara, the Prophet ﷺ also mentioned on how to deal with that. 
and the qaida that the scholars mention with that is uh, that we should, uh, when it comes to these doubts and so forth, well, one of the qawaid is uh, al yaqeen la yazul bishak or la yazul ashak bil yaqeen, la yazul al yaqeen bishak. That certainty is not removed by doubtfulness. Let's look at an example. So, if you're getting ready to pray, and actually Salat al Asr will be coming up sooner for me. The reality is, for Dhuhr, of course, I had wudu. So I am certain I had wudu. Now I have doubt. Now, did I break my wudu after that? Well, I had my coffee. We've been having this lecture. No. Uh, so I have doubt. Huh, I'm not sure. Did I break my wudu or not? That is called shuk. That is doubt. So, mabni ala yaqeen. We build and we establish our ibadah based on certainty. The doubtfulness doesn't remove the certainty. So I'm certain I am on wudu right now. So I could pray if I want to pray rakatain right now. Or when salat comes in, if I want to pray, alhamdulillah, I'm still on wudu. Because I'm not allowing the doubt to remove that which is certain. I was certain I had wudu because I prayed dhuhr. And after that, I have some doubt. Now, did I break my wudu anywhere between this and that and the other? So, no, I don't have any. Uh, hopefully, that kind of deals with it. But I've done a lot, and I know there's a lot of work out there about waswas. And those are just some masail per pertinent to it. So, hopefully, that can be helpful. In addition, when seeking refuge with the law and the feelings of waswas, doubt still lingers, or when saying, Amen to billahi wa rasulihi. Uh, so then you just keep, continue to fight. Don't allow the shaitan. That's the thing. You can't allow the shaitan. Now, everyone's different. And again, some people, they're dealing with something in addition to the waswas. So the waswas is not, as we say, maybe the, uh, or there could be really different reasons for it. Okay. So that it can actually come from maybe someone having uh, uh, you know, as people now are diagnosed with OCD and they're diagnosed with this and Asperger's and this one and that one, all these kind of ailments. <clears throat> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So it depends if someone is dealing with a an actual medical condition or are they dealing with just waswas from the shaitan and from their own doubtfulness. If that's the case, then nam, in all situations, you rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, regardless of that waswas, you do your actions. The waswas may not cease like you want it to. Continue to do your ibadah and your worship. And that's how you, one of the ways that you deal with that, especially if it is not pertaining to a medical condition. If it's a medical condition, then you need to see those people who are in that profession from amongst the Muslim doctors or what have you. And Allah knows best. Uh, is it subh? I don't know, to wear a skull cap? Oh, sunnah. Uh, you know, from the sunnah, it's, it's just wearing something on your head, but really the Prophet, والسلام, from my knowledge, wearing turbans. So this is known and recognized around the world as Islamic dress. It may not have been the specific dress of the Prophet, وسلم, but it's something that distinguishes you as a Muslim in general, we don't see the Yahud, the Yud have their own very small one that covers only a portion of their head. But when you see this, usually it's associated, whether you're in Indonesia, whether you're in Pakistan, well, Pakistani, they generally have their own kind of taqiyya or whatever they call it, uh, a different style. So every country you'll find in different, different styles. In Egypt, you might find this as well. And other places, uh, so the people wear head coverings of their uh, of their customs. So, if you want to get one, go ahead and get one. If it looks good on you, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> when seeking reference of Allah, I feel contempt in knowing Allah's all hearing and all knowing. And is well, I feel contentment. 
not contempt. Contempt means that you are uh, like in animosity or something hostile. Of course, you don't feel hostile to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees and hears everything and is, and is a supporter of the believers. You mean you feel contentness, you are content. Now, I've always wondered why there are shrines of prophets. Uh, this is a nature of human beings. They want to have something in front of them to commemorate people or to worship. They want a physical object. And so you'll find many of the pagan societies that they worship uh, sometimes through physical objects or they have physical objects they directly worship or they make their own gods as the pagans of Quraysh and others did. And this is a common thing now. People have charms, lucky charms, and some of the people will even put their faith in it. You'll have other pagan religions like the Wiccans and others who might have certain things and potions and spells. And people want something physical, even in their quest for that which is ghaibiya, that which is the unseen. Uh, so this is perhaps why people people want something <laughs> physical. Wallahu musta'an. So this is why the people, one of the reasons I guess people uh, pursue that tariqah. What's your advice on saving paper and ink when printing PDFs? <laughs> My advice is to be uh, to be good with saving whatever, you know, being good to the environment. If you want to save ink, then save ink. Do it. That's great. Keep the environment clean. Uh, no problem. Saving the trees and stuff like that. Not being wasteful. That's very important. The main thing is not being wasteful. As for myself, if you mean by printing a lot of PDFs, well, I print PDFs. I don't like reading on a screen. I like physical books. These are PDFs I printed just this week, just probably yesterday. And these are books. I like the physical books I want to be able to go through. I want to mark my books. I do not want to look at them on a computer. And I like books. So PDFs are good resources for things and it depends on the person, but I am a book collector and a book. I like to handle books. I like to write in books. I like to have physical books. No. I'm trying to learn Quran and Arabic. Should I prioritize Usul al or Arba'in? I also have heavy secular studies. Uh, yeah, that's great. Do your um, do your uh, um, <clears throat> have time for Quran, have time for Usul al because this is important Aqidah and uh, Arba'in and Noe, which is a good, well-rounded uh, book. Those Arba'in and Noe. Uh, full of <laughs> abwab, many uh, aspects of the religion, especially pertaining to iman and the heart. Uh, so very, very important. And the, the pillars of Islam and the pillars of iman and so forth. So very important. They don't have to contradict one another. Rather, you can put your energy and, uh, and do it, uh, try to balance yourself to the best of your ability. No. Is it permissible to go to Sisters University graduation? Remember me and your dogs for Tawfiq. Hey, is it permissible to go to Sisters University graduation? I don't know what you mean by a sister. You mean just Muslim sisters in general? You mean your sister? You know, so that depends on what you mean. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. <coughs> And the last question someone asked about my friends follow uh, Sufi Tariqah. Um, is it friend to be a Mubtidia? So if your friends are on those Tariqah, it's going to be a problem for you probably in the future. So it's better for you to have people who believe like you and believe in the creed of Ahl Sunnah. Now I'm not saying you run and you go and destroy all of your friends and, and, and everything. But I am saying that, you know, a person is on the religion of their companions so that you want 
good people who remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's very important. You want good companions from Ahlul Sunnah. So that's what I would say is to seek out uh, people from Ahlul Sunnah. And if you have knowledge and ability, then, uh, then um, make dua for your friends as well as show them evidence for their beliefs. But eventually the stronger you get in the Iman, and the Qawaid and the principles of the Salaf, it's going to be hard for you to maintain closeness with people who are in bid'ah and deviance, especially if your companionship is based on the Quran and the Sunnah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallam